Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. In India, I met farmers whose crops have been literally washed away by historic flooding. In America, I have witnessed unprecedented droughts in California. In Greenland and in the Arctic, I was astonished to see that ancient glaciers are rapidly disappearing, well ahead of scientific predictions. All that I have seen and learned on my journey has absolutely terrified me. So the question now is whether we will have the courage to act before it's too late, and how we answer will have a profound impact on the world that we leave behind, not just to you, but to your children and to your grandchildren. As a president, as a father, and as an American, I'm here to say we need to act. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. All right, welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris, and I'm joined with Jim Winepress again. Hey, Jim. Hello. Happy to be back. I know, I know. After last week's, you know, uh, horrible news, you know, we had to have you back because this week it just seems like there's just been a ton of great news out there. I definitely wanted to have an opportunity to come back and talk about uh, more positive stories. I didn't want you to um, lose people, um, your fans of the show, because every time Jim Winepress came on, uh, everyone became depressed. I know. I was so, like, <laughs> happy to be back for a more positive show. Thank yes. you for having me. Yes, don't turn off the uh, the podcast. Don't don't stop listening. It's it's actually a lot of a lot of good news. Yeah, a lot of lot, I mean, there's some heavy stuff in here, but you know, a lot of good stuff this week. It was you know really great to to to, to follow the news throughout the week, see what's going on around the world, and and then just for the listeners, Angie is traveling. This has been been a planned uh, vacation. Now she's going up to Michigan to the family's farm. So she's going to be out for a couple of weeks. I, we're still recording our animal episodes, but Jim's been nice enough to, to fill in and yeah, awesome, awesome guest, uh, guest host. So thank you, Jim, again. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, whenever you want to send those checks, just let me know. I can give you my, uh, my address, send, send it back <laughs> yeah. to the States. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll send you a bill because we're running to the red right now, but it's okay. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah, we uh with all the hosting and stuff, we yeah, we'll get there though. We'll get there. Yeah, definitely. But we make it big, you know, and Angie and I are like rolling in money besides giving it to the, the rhino orphanage, we'll just send oh, it thank to you. you. Okay. You're your so, your apprentice you know. host. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So anyways, okay. So the big news this week, Jim, is it and I just really kind of want to talk about this. And it's not to be negative. It's just I think this is more of an enlightening thing. And I promise you, the other stories I chose are they're they're all really great stories, great news coming out of conservation. But this one has been making the rounds, and that's about Iceland starting to whale again. And I you know, I don't know how much you've been able to read into this this week, but just to kind of sum it up, Iceland has harvested their first fin whale and the fin whale is endangered. So there is a bunch of international bans on whaling this whale. There's international bans on transporting whale meat, you know, any products developed from these whales. But this company out of Iceland said, to heck with you, we're going to go and start whaling. So doing some digging and really what is going on. So the fin whale is huge. It's been called a pygmy blue whale. And so that I was kind of, you know, looking this up last night, like thinking, okay, you know, is this a blue whale? Is it not? And, you know, so mm -hmm. I just go with the IUCN, you know, that that's who you want to, you know, the fact checked, I guess is, is who I really go to. And the phylogeny of the fin whale still kind of undetermined. So, it is closely related to blue whales, but I don't think it is a blue whale itself. Yeah, you know, hopefully more scientists are, are out there trying to figure that out. Regardless, these things are huge. The, they, they reach 80, 90 feet long and, you know, weigh multiple hundreds of tons, massive, massive whales. So they're endangered. 
you know, just like the blue whales endangered. And this company in Iceland has, has started to harvest them, go out and, and kill them and collect them. So, you know, who this is, is it, it's Christian Lofsen in Iceland. He, he's well known. I mean, you can, you can look this up on the internet and it's his company and the company's, uh, I can't even, uh, Havler HF. So it's spelled H V A L U R H F out of Iceland. And they've just decided they, they've, they've had a two year pause to whaling, but they have started to whale again this year and they've actually given themselves, uh, permits for 200. These are self-described permits. These aren't, there's no governing body giving permits to anybody to, um, you know, whale these whales. They just said, Hey, you know, we're going to go collect 200 and, and pretend this is all, all great. So Jim, do you think whale meat is that popular? I don't know. You worked a lot with marine mammals. Uh, well, I mean, from our cultural standpoint in the States, no, it's not. The, animals living out there that's the valuable part especially if they're an endangered species and especially if we don't completely understand you know exactly who they're related to or or what they are so going out and taking these animals and depleting the population even more so than it already is doesn't make sense but you know food items food items that we eat in america are complete sound completely backwards to people in other cultures so to you know someone in iceland eating whale meat might be equivalent to me having a burger i don't know that but i still don't support that Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. So that's what I, that was my question, right? Because you're, you're absolutely right. It's, and one thing, Angie and I, or, you know, anybody that, that does this stuff, even scientists, we should be careful, you know, you know, I'm going to, I grew up in the United States, so that's my culture, right? And my European culture of my parents and grandparents and all that stuff. I can't go to China and these other countries and say, oh, you can't eat that, you know, unless it's an endangered eel right. or something. <laughs> that, but, you, you know, I was curious, is whale meat really that much in demand? And it's not. That's the thing. It is not in demand. So if you actually look into it, Icelanders don't eat whale meat. 98% of Icelanders don't eat whale meat. And over, I think it's like 55% don't support the whaling industry. They think it's, they're upset that this guy's out there doing it. But there's then what's the point? What's it, the point of it? Yeah. So there is there is a uh, there is some part of the, the Icelandic culture. They did eat whale. Uh, some very, very few people do. And over 40 percent of the country still supports hunting fin whales. So there still is this. I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't know how to break the, the cycle. But what this guy's doing, OK, is shipping whale meat or what he has on the past is ship whale meat to Japan. Okay. So do you think, do you think whale meat's big in Japan or you would think it would be right? There are a lot of random and strange wildlife products that are popular in Japan. So I yeah. guess there's yeah. a chance it could be. Right. So I go ahead and look this up again. Yeah. You know, that's what I love about this podcast platform is because I can do all the work for other people. So make sure you send in those questions for the listeners. So I was curious. I'm like, okay. And I've heard this. I I heard whale meat wasn't that popular in Japan, but you know, you hear they come by down here in the Antarctica where I'm at and they hunt three, 400 minke whales every year. They hunt fin whale. Uh, We know they've hunted blue whale in the past and sold the meat. So looking at whale meat in Japan, what it is, that during World War II, okay, so after World War II, Japan was decimated, the country was decimated. Uh, MacArthur, you know, the occupation, trying to rehabilitate the country and rebuild it and all this stuff. He told them, okay, he, he helped build up this whaling fleet and said, go get whale meat. And we'll use that to feed the, the population. And so they did. And so a lot of these older Japanese have grown up eating whale meat as part of their culture, right? So what they describe it in Japan is it's more of a nostalgic food. There isn't a huge demand. It's just the older population that grew up eating this, remembering, oh, when I was young, this is what we ate, so I'm going to eat some. So there's a small market for whale meat in Japan. It's very small. It's not this huge you know, demand. And, and I would say our generation and younger, they want nothing to do with it. Right. So, yeah. So hopefully it dies out soon. You know, Hopefully that demand dies out soon. Now. Really quick. So what, I don't want this to be the whole podcast. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, 
it's just this one just had me riled up, you know, if you can't tell. So what this guy's doing, um, what's his name again? Christian Lofson is he's going to be making nutritional supplements and other products out of these whales. So he's going out there killing endangered whales and he's going to turn them into vitamins, which is just asinine. It's Completely. just crazy. Yeah. And yeah, if you were talking yeah. about, you know, a small group of people who were doing subsistence hunting, you know, where every single part mm-hmm. of the whale is being used and they've been doing it for generations and generations. I would have a different opinion about that. But, but this just, this seems like a weird quick way to make a profit over nostalgia yeah, and, exactly. you know, vitamins, which yeah. who knows if they work. It seems like yeah. a, making a quick dollar and just doing a whole lot of damage to do so. Yeah. To the ecosystem and to a, to a whale population that's struggling to increase. And I, you know, for anybody that has not listened to the blue whale episode, please do the, the fin whale, you know, same thing happened to them, almost hunted to extinction. And now they're, they are, the population is rebounding. There is roughly 50,000 fin whales in the world, which isn't a lot because the ocean is enormous, right? So in the Northern hemisphere, you know, fin whales are in the Pacific and the Atlantic. And they want to collect 200 a year, you know, within five years, there's a thousand. And I mean, it's just, it adds up quickly and their generation interval is so long. So anyways, I just, you know, I'm going to keep my other good, I have feel good stories coming up, but I will keep tracking this because I want to see what these supplements are, you know, how he's marketing them, who he's selling them to, because I think we need to, again, vote with our dollar, you know, ban these products, not ban, you know, boycott these products. I would boycott going to Iceland. I really want to go to Iceland, but until the Iceland government steps in and says, no, we're not going to do this because it, it's against so many treaties. And, ugh. Anyways, um, you know, we need to put pressure on them and there's no way in heck I am going to, you know, let this story die and, you know, I'll, I'll keep tabs on it and see, see what happens. And it has to be some blowback from this type of behavior. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's terrible. I mean, uh, you know, the, the minky whale is not endangered and, and, you know, I, I've watched whale wars and it, I'm kind of apparent to it. I, I, I don't like the idea of it. It makes me really sad for the whales, but thankfully the minky whales are not endangered. So that's the only good thing out of it is they're not, yeah, but they are still hunting blue whales though. I mean, that's the thing. I, I know they have found blue whale meat in the markets in Japan. I just think, oh, it's horrible. I just, oh yeah. Anyways. <laughs> All right. So let's, here's with a good story, Jim. Okay. All right. Okay. We're making a comeback. Here we go. So yeah. this is a good story um, out of South Carolina by a ring build gull named Gumpy. There you go. That, mm-hmm. that really, that really sets the mood for this next um, story. Yeah. So yeah. Um, recently, Gumpy was found at Fort Sumter, which is right next to the South Carolina Aquarium, and his legs were tangled in fishing line to the point where they both had to be amputated at the ankles. Uh, so kind of a downer beginning, but it gets better. Yeah, um, yeah. He was brought to the aquarium and was uh, seen by the South Carolina Aquarium's veterinarian, Dr. Shane Boylan. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet him. Uh, really charismatic oh, cool. guy, really intelligent guy, super passionate. He looked at that bird and he said, this animal should should not be euthanized. Um, and so what he did was he obviously cleaned up his wounds and started feeding him, which is really impressive because this species of gull, it's the most common species of gull in America. And I looked it up mm-hmm. and it's just a, a very typical looking gull. These are the gulls that you see, the lakes. Um, right, right. Their migration patterns are all across the country. These are the ones you see in the uh, parking lots. And he started basically rehabbing him by feeding him fish, getting vitamins in him, and really brought him back. And then they took it to the very next level. And he's now working with the College of Charleston's Department of Teaching, Learning, and Technology. And they're, they're outfitting this gull with a pair of 3D carbon-printed lower legs. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Which is incredible. Um, and they've already created a prototype. Uh, they put it on him. They evaluated it and said, we'd like to see him walk a little bit better. So they're kind of going back to the drawing board and they're having a new pair uh, printed out soon. Uh, but I That's just thought awesome. that was so interesting. And that speaks a lot of the aquarium and it speaks a lot to this veterinarian to put all this work and effort into a very common species. You know, he's not discounting an animal where, you know, 
it's it's common. Um, it, you know, it's not in danger, right. and it has the reputation of being pest. And he's putting the effort, mm-hmm. and it's making a real difference for this animal. And this isn't the first animal to have a prosthetic built for it. You know, we all know was it Winter the Dolphin, right? Um, in Florida, yep. so yep. It, it is possible. And that just made made me feel really good. And uh, the name Gumpy comes from Forrest Gump, yeah, <laughs> because um, he yeah. had his ma- magic shoes, um, which is what his mom referred to as his leg braces. So yeah, um, that's, true. that's I, true. I really like that. You know, for all the the damage that we do to the environment, obviously this animal was tangled in fishing line. We're reversing that and putting the effort back into it, and it's going to make a real difference to this individual gall, and it's going to make a difference to every single person who hears the story. And that makes me yeah. Happy. Yeah, no, and it's, I mean, you're right. It's taking a common species rescue. I know when I lived in South Carolina, I did some wildlife rescue and rehab with with my wife. We rescued possums, uh, squirrels, and, and bunnies and, you know, rehabbed them and then re-released them in the wild, trained them, trained the squirrels for a little bit and released them. So there are a lot of people, you know, I was amazed at the community of wildlife rehab, bird rehab. So for an aquarium and a veterinarian to, to put so much effort into, you know, prosthetic legs, it's, it's not, first of all, it's not cheap to get all that done, but a lot of time and effort on their part and, and, and money, you know, is, it's, a, that's, a, that's incredible. That's a good story. Yeah. And I, I imagine, you know, the animal physiologist in me is like, okay, put those on, observe the animal. And it's just, it's like training them to, to walk again oh, yeah. you know, with it. And, and then they get used to it and then they're, you know. And then let's see if they can re-release them or, you know, keep them under human care at least and feed them. And he has a full life. Yeah, I so, don't. I yeah, don't, it's awesome. I don't believe he'll be releasable, but he'll make an amazing yeah. ambassador for his species. And, you know, the good work that's done at zoos and aquariums. And keep in mind, he's doing this while he's the lead vet for an entire aquarium. So right. he's jumping from a yeah. Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, you know, to a North American river otter to the seagull. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I've, I've. Now I know a bunch of veterinarians that I trained or when they were undergrads or they were grad students in my lab and, you know, they, they do it out of love because you don't get rich being a vet. If people don't know that mm-hmm. vets don't make a lot of money. They really don't. They're, they're not like human medicine, medical doctors in the United States that make tons of money. These guys make barely anything and they do it out of the, the love of their heart. So anyways, so Jim, I'm going to start off a little sad, but it gets good. Okay. Good. All right. <laughs> so. So the headline that came across was one of the only wild jaguars known to roam in the United States is believed to have been killed. It is one that there's one of three. This is one of three that would go across the border, you know, back and forth. So the Tucson based Northern Jaguar project uh, this week released images and basically they identified this animal was poached because they, they found um, pictures of the pelt. And so they were able to identify this jaguar because they all have individual, you know, unique mm-hmm. spots. So this one, unfortunately, was killed in Mexico, they they believe. And so it was, you know, the jaguars have been kind of driven out of the American Southwest. But there's a huge but with this. And that is following up with that, despite the, you know, the horrific, you know, poaching of, of one, that actually wild jaguars in Mexico have been really the populations have been really growing and the the last estimate is just over the last eight years wild jaguars in mexico have grown by 20 percent wow so yeah they they're doing a really great job down there uh, i guess it's up there and to the east for me but down there for you <laughs> yeah used to be i'm just so used to growing up you know north of mexico mm-hmm. so it's it's I'm, I'm south of them now but it, it was they so what they've done is over the last eight years is they've had these remote activated cameras, over 400 of them in 11 Mexican States taken over 4,500 photographs over 60 days. And they were able to, of those 4,500, 350 were of Jaguars. And so they were able to identify 46 different individuals. So, you know, and then they've also captured lots of other animals, which is interesting because a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if you remember that story Jesse was talking about, but AI helping these camera traps. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 So I was thinking of all those photographs that it just made me think of that, that artificial intelligence. I'm like, I bet you they could probably use that. Definitely <laughs> that's, use that, yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of uh, going through a lot of images. But anyways, the Jaguar 
is is making a comeback and that's that's really great and the estimates of you know the jags all the way from mexico into south america is there's about 64,000 IUCN okay so their their numbers are are grow i mean decreasing but you know it's good to see them increasing in mexico you know while we got to fight this deforestation that's going on in the amazon you know they're losing their habitat but but i thought that was really great news i was really excited to see that you know uh, mexico again uh, doing good things for wildlife um so bravo to them yeah and the the presence of a predator such as the jaguar is a marker that you know those ecosystems are healthy because to support mm-hmm. a predator like that there has to be so many other things from pristine habitat to enough prey items to support those animals um so that's a great sign. Yeah, yeah, and jaguars. Oh, I've I've been able to to scratch jaguars. A little oh, bit really? Train oh, them with oh, my I'm wife. jealous. So, yeah, they're they are amazing. It, it was yeah. yeah. Anyway, as long as, save that for another pod. But yeah, they're they are impressive. Like they are just wow. Well, you you hope with you know that killing getting some publicity, it will shed some light on the mm-hmm. fact that these animals are around. And then we can hopefully be proactive about that. And the people who will be coexisting with these animals can, you know, hopefully learn how to peacefully live with them where they could be. And at the same time, dispel myths or fears that they may have about them. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. You know, they, they're big cats. They're, but again, they're, they're going to avoid humans as much as they can. So. Well, good. All right. I, you know, right. I'm feeling good about this. We are, we're, we're already about a hundred times more positive than we were last time at this point. Yeah. <laughs> last week. <laughs> I know. Last week it's like, oh man, <laughs> like, what's going on? I want to hear it. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. But it's good news. Yeah, it's good right. news. So, um, my next story, I think it's a positive one. I feel pretty good about this one. Um, but chefs across the country mm-hmm. call on Congress to defend sustainable U.S. fisheries. Um, and this story that I read comes out of Monterey, California. So there is um, mm-hmm. this bill that's about to be voted on the House floor. And this could have actually happened as early as um, this past Tuesday on the 26th. And it's called H.R. 200. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm the farthest thing from a politician, but what I've read is that if this bill is passed, it's mm-hmm. going to weaken sustainability measures um, in the, and I'm going to hopefully I'll pronounce it correctly, the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And this is America's primary fisheries management mm-hmm. law. Um, this has been around for a while. It was reauthorized in 2006, and it has been an unqualified success uh, and is able to recovery of 44 different um, depleted fish species, while positioning the U.S. as a global leader Mm -hmm. in science-based fisheries management, which is crucial, especially for how much we love seafood. Right. In response to this, uh, June 14th, chefs in cities all over the place, and we're not talking just around the water, um, in cities including Omaha, Phoenix, Honolulu, Los Angeles, Denver, Kansas City, Cleveland, Sarasota, and New York joined together to celebrate um, that existing law's success in a hashtag chefs for fish evening where they serve sustainable us seafood dishes um, and mm-hmm. urge their customers to defend it from the threats in congress and they actually provided i saw a photo a printout outlining the bill what's at risk and what it means to your dining options the chefs have been very vocal they've pointed right. out that responsible fisheries management um, it's not just an issue for fishermen um, or coastal residents it's important to anyone who enjoys fresh american caught seafood and that is a whole lot of people <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, to come from, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about that and it's not, it, yeah, this is, th- these are chefs, you know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. these aren't environmental yeah. activists. These are chefs, you know, that are like, Hey, you know, this, this is my livelihood and we need sustainable fisheries. That's yeah, great. I like it. And that's really great. You took that's the really words great. right out of my mouth. Yeah, the support from these chef, yeah. chefs is really significant because people expect to hear these concerns and complaints from conservationists, animal care professionals, environmentalists. But when an outside group becomes active and vocal, especially a group that values fish in a very different way than, you know, say an aquarist would, people take notice. It's it's no longer the small, Mm -hmm. you know, special interest group that has these feelings. It's actually a lot of different people coming together with a lot of different motivations and viewpoints saying that this specific practice or set of practices is necessary. And, I'm sure those chefs carry a lot of weight with them because 
they are in charge of these restaurants or contribute to these restaurants that bring in millions of dollars every single year. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So oh, yeah. Yeah. no matter what your motivation is to care, I feel like you kind of tap into that. And yeah, it's interesting because yeah. when, when I'm at the zoo and I'm talking about, you know, conservations and basically trying to convince people to think a different way or, or change their practice practices to, you know, to help coexist peacefully with, with wildlife, um, you have to kind of tap into all those different interests and values that a person may have um, in order to relate mm -hmm. to them or, or really reach out to them. And it's, this, this is big. People, people love their food and if there's money involved, they're going to be listening. Yeah. You know, and my family is, you know, long time ago, my uncles are all tuna fishermen. So, you know, we've been connected to the oceans and, you know, we need sustainable practices out there. And then, so just a few weeks ago, we were talking about that app that the Nat, you know, NOAA, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration developed for fishermen that they could, you know, takes into account using, you know, a lot of different programming, whatever, you know, where the, the sustainable fish are. So we need to come together. I will say, I will say this, Jim, next week's interview is really great. And uh, scientists that we interview, he actually does uh, some sea turtle stuff. And he, I asked him about plastics in the ocean. Obviously, it's, it's a huge problem with sea turtles, but he agreed that he thinks there is this groundswell movement of banning, you know, straws and things. And from his perspective, so that was really great to hear, you know, from somebody that he's just a scientist, researcher. I know how busy he gets. He's not paying attention to this all the time. And that, you know, there is this this change for the ocean. So that's cool. great. That's really Yeah. Great. And to any, anyone who's interested in learning more about this stuff, off the top of my head, I can think of three different sustainable seafood um, programs, whether it's information you can look up online or apps that you can download. You've got the Oceanwide, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, excuse me, Oceanwise app. Uh, you've got the Monterey Bay Aquarium mm -hmm. Seafood Watch, and then you've got the Good Catch. Mm -hmm. Those are all yep. apps and information online that will tell you all about the food you're eating um, and the level of sustainability that comes with it, what foods that you should go ahead and buy and what you should avoid. So there's... And I'm sure there's more. <laughs> no, I remember last week you mentioned that. So I did link it on the show notes. I'll link it again for this week's too under the news on the website. So, you know, if you're, you can look at it on, on your handheld devices, it, you click on it and it should take you directly to the download. So you can put that on your phone. Yeah, I'm curious. I, I want to look it up because I'm curious about the fish that I'm eating down here. You know, I know mm -hmm. salmon's pretty popular, but we have like hokey and some other things that are, that are local. So I just want to make sure whatever I purchase is sustainable. So, well, yeah, I, I always have to look it up now. Yeah, so let's let's get, let's keep it in the ocean. So this next one is, is interesting, especially as a scientist. So again, Jim it starts off bad, but it gets good. <laughs> so, <laughs> as the, long as it gets good, it gets I good. Mean, the, yeah, so that's, that's good. Okay, we can get. Okay, so apparently there was a disease that pretty much melted starfish. And this was taking, taking place in the, the Pacific Northwest. So, you know, the West Coast from California up. Starting about 2013, starfish were just basically dissolving into goo. I mean, just so it was this mass mortality event that was going on. And again, you know, I don't, I never even heard about this until this week, but talk about a huge hit to the ecosystem. I mean, just massive, massive hit to the ecosystem that they had an 80% die off of starfish over the West coast. It was just crazy. I, yeah. I didn't know that. I, I didn't know this was going on, but here's again, another big, but it's totally been reversed that the populations have completely rebounded and they're actually coming back. So what happened was in 2013, they identified this Denso virus that was spreading and they think global warming, the warming of the oceans, which we know is having an effect on fish and ocean going creatures. I mean, I've read tons of scientific studies on it. You know, migration patterns of sharks have changed, things like that. So the starfish being an ecto echinoderm or a marine invertebrate, okay, was affected by this virus and they basically just, it broke, broke it down and it just kind of dissolved which was just crazy. Sounds like science fiction. So, it is totally right. Like, you know, I don't know. I think of the wizard of Oz, right. you know, I'm melting. I'm melting. <laughs> that's what was going on. But you know, this is how, if you want to see how evolution works and this is happening so rapidly, but there are starfish or there were starfish that were resistant to it. 
Okay. So the juvenile starfish that had carried the genes that were resistant to this virus have survived and thrived. And they're the ones that are bouncing back. So, you know, whenever we talk about biodiversity and maintaining the gene pool or a diverse gene pool, this is why, you know, one disease just can't come in and wipe them out. Now, if a new disease emerged that these weren't resistant to, it'd probably just wipe them out right. completely. But, you know, that the chances of that happening, hopefully, are, and they are pretty slim. So, but the good news is they're actually bouncing back. So, you know, with some of this stuff, nature does find a way, right? Did we say that last week? Yeah. Life finds a way, you know, Jurassic Park. Yeah. So they're bouncing back. So that's good news. That's good news. Nature is fighting back in, in some of this stuff. And I think if we help it out, we'll, we'll get back to a balanced ecosystem. Look at that. Yeah. Evolution in action right there. Yeah. 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 It happened so rapidly. You know, I used to talk about it with like, I, with, mm -hmm. you have dewormers, right? You, we deworm our dogs. We deworm our, our livestock, our horses, things like that. A lot of parasitic resistance is popping up because we kill 99% of the worms or the bugs but that 1% that's resistant, they just, they, they survive and thrive, you know, yeah. it's evolution in action. So, so here you go. Starfish are, are surviving and thriving. That's great news. Well, good. See, good. Glad to hear it. <laughs> yep. 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 And then my next story is just awesome. Feel good. No bad stuff. So. All right. Well, we're going to, we're sticking with the theme of oceans and I, I have no problem with yeah. that, but if I'm lucky enough to be on here again, I promise I'll try to get some terrestrial news going on in here. Okay. Uh, so the Canadian government, uh, recently launched its Wales initiative in Vancouver, Canada, um, with an announcement of a $167.4 million initiative to help protect whales. Hmm. And this is all going to go to the protection um, and the support and recovery of the southern resident killer whale, which gets a lot of attention, I feel like, because um, that's been a struggling population. Yeah. Um, the North Atlantic right whale, which has been in trouble for a long time, considering it gets its common name from whalers who used to call it the right whale to hunt because it was just so easy to hunt down and kill. Yeah. And then the St. Lawrence um, estuary beluga whale, which has also seen a decrease in its population numbers. So mm -hmm. they have, they're taking all this money and they're going to be putting it towards a number of different initiatives. I'm going to go over this because they've identified all these human caused threats, including lack of prey, underwater noise, contaminants, all things that are negatively affecting these groups of animals. And the initiative uh, plans to improve prey availability, uh, specifically for the southern resident right whale. Um, they're going to be doing this uh, by reducing the total fishery removal of Chinook salmon by 25 to 35 percent in order to provide hmm. and make sure that there's more prey for these super large mammals to feed upon. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. They're also going to be implementing mandatory fishery closures in specific areas where the whales forage for food. Um, they're going to close them down even to recreational fin fishing and, like I said, commercial um, salmon fishing uh, and explore ways to use additional regulatory measures. So, the, so that's saying a lot. If, they, if they're willing to not negatively affect, but basically say, you know, we're willing to make changes that will, will change how our economy runs, that means they're really invested in conserving this group of animals. Right, right. Yeah, it's, you know, we just had your story about the chefs, right, fighting for sustainable mm -hmm. fisheries in the United States. It's, a, and I, we try not to d dip into politics too much, but sometimes you have to. Mm -hmm. I, I understand deregulation and the sentiment behind it, but my God, the EPA, I like clean water, Jim. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like, I don't want to be poisoning my children. I don't want, you know, a lot of this fracking and all this other stuff to be deregulated so they can just dump chemicals wherever they want because it's right. cheaper, you know, it makes business sense. So why are we deregulating protections in the ocean where here in Canada, they're tightening them and pouring money into it. So, so go Canada, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. I just, you know, without naming names, I just, I vote environmental. Like that's just my thing now. Like mm -hmm. I, I look at the issues. I realize the, the crisis we're in, uh, you know, I don't, the, the, I'm, you know, I'm, everybody looks at multiple issues, but I'm becoming a single issue voter. You know, what are you doing for the environment? What are you doing for endangered species? Because mm -hmm. I want something for my great, great grandkids. You know, I want them to be able to go and see whales. I want them to be able to eat salmon. I want them to be able to go and experience a lot of this stuff. So anyways, yeah, it's a good yeah. job on Canada. Yeah. yeah. So instead of There's Iceland, go to Canada, please. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Support support Canada. They're, and and 
just to add a couple of things, they're not, and they're not just saying, you know, we're going to decrease the fisheries. They're, they're also implementing a lot of really interesting scientific measures and u- utilizing scientific research in order to understand um, the cause and effect of contaminants. Also, they're going to be utilizing hydrophones to really get a better understanding of where and how the noise pollution from boats come in, um, both mm-hmm. recreational um, and commercial. So they're really attacking this from all fronts. And I really yeah, uh, yeah, and I mean, I I fished salmon off Vancouver Island, you know, numbers of years ago, uh, with my dad and my brother. We'd go fishing up there, and just you know, it, there's an industry there, but I they everybody can get along, right? Like there's just mm-hmm. and, it, and it was a fishing season, so salmon's you know it was heavily regulated back then too. So you know, it's just good news. That's good news that governments are are stepping up. And again, Canada's beautiful. Go to Vancouver. You're how far are you from Canada? couple hour drive yeah just, hour a, drive. just a couple hours yeah as long as you got your passport yeah. it's a day's drive yeah yeah so you, you're, you're right up there near the mm-hmm. border so yeah i love it and i, I love my canadians so <laughs> shout out to all the canadians <laughs> out there it's just a great great country <laughs> yeah way to take pride in the wildlife yes yes all right so jim this next one is just yeah it was funny uh my wife sent it to me on facebook and then angie sent it to me on facebook she's like make sure you talk about this uh, I, I of course i was going to talk about this and that is the reintroduction of 31 Przewalski horses have been transported from Czechoslovakia to Mongolia. And this is actually the Prague Zoo, who is actually major, major player in rehabilitating the population of Przewalski horses because they were one of the, yeah, they were one of the leaders a long time ago in the seventies, 1970s that said, Hey, we can save the species. Let's do it. And they helped organize uh, all the other zoos uh, and conservation centers around to, there was only 12, 12 breeding animals. That was it. You know, now today we have 2000 and their population's increasing. So anyways, the, the Czechoslovenia army had an aircraft. And so it was just this week, they sent four mares to make the total 31 that they've, they've moved to this protected reserve in Mongolia. So there, the four mares were Yanja, Helmi, Hannah, and Spes, or Spees. I don't know how to say that, whatever it is in Czech. But they, you know, near the Gobi Desert. And I, I just, it's just, I love the Przewalski horse. It was episode six. It was one of, I think, Angie and I's first better episodes, you know, still cutting our teeth on some of our early ones. But Angie and I just love, obviously love horses and, and love these special creatures. And it's just one of my favorite stories about how a species on the brink can be brought back. And it was multiple agencies, you know, lots of zoos around the world that held these animals under captivity. And now we reintroduce them into Mongolia. We reintroduce them to China. And I believe Russia is going to start reintroducing some now too, or there are some in a, in a protected reserve there. So, you know, bravo to them, bravo to the Prog Zoo for everything they've done for this species. And I just, uh, I love hearing about this stuff. I love reintroductions. That is the goal. That's what we want to get to, you know, protect the habitat, make sure it's safe, and then put the animals back. Yeah, in it's, it. it's nice to hear a, a success story in conservation, you know, not just identifying the threat and what we can do to slow it down. It's, you know, from start to finish. And, you know, the story continues, but like this is what how we did it correctly. You know, we got to hear those right. good news conservation stories. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's been, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. Species of the week. Yeah, definitely. You find yeah. Um, well, my, my, my species of the week, I, I hope you don't mind. I got a little twist on that. Um, okay. Because okay. I am a huge fan of natural history museums. Um, right. I'm still very much that little kid who likes to go look at all the dinosaurs but I absolutely love that. I go to the, I gave a, a talk at the science museum in Rochester. I love going to our, our the Buffalo um, museum of science, just really mm-hmm. great facilities, just full of information. And mm-hmm. recently there's been a little bit of hype about how new technology um, is allowing scientists to investigate natural history museum specimens in a way that have never been possible. And an animal that has actually been in a collection for decades, if not more could be found to be a different species um, yeah, because when some of these species were first collected, they didn't have the genetic testing um, procedures and methods mm-hmm. that are available today. And all of a sudden you have these researchers coming back and taking a look and saying, this isn't what I thought it was, or this is mislabeled. 
this is a brand new species. And I, and I like that right. because sometimes people think of museums as just old dusty places that, you know, archive the past, but it's not. Lots of new technology is being utilized in natural history museums. Uh, there's a whole lot of research being done and you can I, discover a new species that has been sitting in front of you for a hundred years or so. And right, right. so the perfect example of this is the ruby sea dragon. All right, so the ruby sea dragon um, is in the same family with the well-known seahorse and pipefish. And for a long time, mm -hmm. only two species were known, um, the leafy sea dragon and the common sea dragon. Uh, then come along as a biologist who's a graduate student named Josephine Stiller at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And uh, she was studying the relatedness mm -hmm. between those sea dragon populations. While she was doing the genetic analysis of those two known species, um, she stumbled across a sample that really didn't quite fit. And she realized she was looking at a brand new species. So mm. after doing this just kind of traditional look at these animals to understand these two established species more, she accidentally discovered a new species. And now, and after, uh. let's see, two years after publishing that she had discovered this or identified this third species, they finally saw a living specimen off the coast of Australia, which I just think is the coolest thing. It just shows how relevant still awesome. um, natural history museums are. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, it is, it is, it is, it is like if, yeah, oh, we, if you go back to uh, the uh, Burmese Python episode, I talk about Titanoboa and how that was discovered by just a grad student at uh, university of Florida. And so I, you know, I was dorking out because I was at the museum when they had the exhibit out and he was like walking around giving tours. And I was just like starstruck. I mean, I've met celebrities. I've met some big, big name celebrities as friends, but this guy, I was just I was starstruck by a grad student. It was great. So, cause he discovered Titanoboa, you know, the largest snake ever to live. So that, that's a great story. Yeah. That's awesome. So I'd rather meet that person as a celebrity than yeah. any other. Person. Yeah, I mean, like like that's a that's a real accomplishment. It's huge. Right there. He was like, you know, it it was amazing. It was an amazing story. You know how they how they identified this huge sixty foot snake. So, mm -hmm. all right. So last week you were kind of on this token thing about you know discovery of the new species. <laughs> yeah. So I found six new species of goblin spiders have been found in Sri Lanka. And they're named after famous goblins and brownies. So there you go. Oh, very yeah. nice. Very appropriate. Enid Blyton's children's books have been very popular since, you know, the 1930s and 40s. And so they have named all these spiders after characters in her book. So one is Zestapsis candy is this new goblin spider, but they've identified six new species of little goblin spiders. And they're, they're really crazy looking again on the show notes i put the the pictures of this i'll put the uh, red uh, sea dragon on there and then i'll def or the ruby sea dragon and then i'll definitely put a picture of the goblin spider so uh, this paper was just published in evolutionary systematics uh, named after characters in a children's book so oh, so good for them perfect yeah <laughs> yeah so anyways good week good week in conservation let's keep this momentum going let's let's fight for these animals let's be political, be active, mm -hmm. you know, don't use single use plastics, keep fighting for the environment. We'll keep bringing you good stories. I promise. But again, we're, you know, if, if, if it's a bad week, it's a bad week. We just got to, you know, speak the truth. This is what's going on out there, but thank you for listening, Jim. Thank you for coming back. Oh, thank you for giving me a second chance to, uh, redeem yeah. myself and have a, have a good episode. I appreciate that. <laughs> Well, I think Angie wants you to do next week, too. So hopefully you'll be back next week. If, uh, if you'll have me, I'll yeah. be here. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So thank you for listening. And uh, we've got a, a big episode on Tuesday coming out, a great interview on Thursday. And we'll be back next Friday with another recap in conservation news. Thanks for listening. Take care. Take care.